I worked, uh, as you were told, in the UK diplomatic service for about 25 years, uh, and then I joined the UN and uh, found myself in Unprofor in uh, Croatia in 1995 as the head of the political unit in Unprofor about three weeks before uh, the events took place in Srebrenica. So it was quite a, 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 a busy start to my time in the UN. I would then went to uh, Belgrade and I was in fact sent here three times by the UN to Belgrade. Uh, I was head of mission, in, uh, as you said, in Haiti and uh, deputy in Sarajevo. And in New York, I was director of peacekeeping for Asia and the Middle East. Um, so I worked in about seven UN peacekeeping missions, and I've been responsible for another five above that. Uh, but the important thing is that I'm a practitioner, not an academic. Um, and I have one added advantage, and that is that I'm retired. So any judgments I make are, are my own, not those of the United Nations nor any of my other previous masters. Now, I'm very aware that I'm actually speaking under the auspices of the <coughs> Faculty of Media and Communications. So before I start, let me say that peace and security in the world uh, has much to do with communications. And uh, some would say it has all to do with communications these days. Uh, but I'm not going to talk that much about uh, communications because I know that this subject is better covered by others, uh, in particular my friend Milos Struga, who sits in the front as an, an expert in that area. Um, two bits of good news for you before I start. The one is that um, there's no PowerPoint, uh, and the other is that I've just noticed written at the top of the page, shortened version. So uh, those of you who've made it through this grisly weather, uh, I won't keep you too long. So, I recently asked a group of students of mine uh, to write 100 words on the state of the world today. One of the smarter students produced the following 39 words. Our world in 2016. Our phones, wireless. Our cooking, fireless. Our cars, keyless, our food, fatless, our tires, tubeless, our youth, jobless, our leaders, our leaders, shameless, our relationships, meaningless, our attitudes, careless, our feelings, heartless, our children, mannerless, we're speechless, governments are clueless, and our politicians are worthless. I am scared, shitless. <laughs> Not bad, 39 words. Later, Eli Wiesel, Nobel Prize winner, according to the Nobel Committee, a messenger to mankind, said just before he died, the winds of madness are blowing. Pope Francis said a while ago, World War III has already started. The world really is in a mess, isn't it? I have spent my life working in the fields of diplomacy and security, and I don't really remember a moment when so much of the world was in such danger as it is right now. I don't remember a time when so much was being asked of leaders in the world and so little vision and statesmanship was being shown. Europe is currently facing several complex and dynamic security risks at the same time. Europeans are experiencing greater vulnerability and a feeling that the security architecture, which they've so carefully built up over the past few decades, has suddenly become more fragile than they thought. Never before have security and prosperity in Europe depended so much on security and prosperity elsewhere. Geographic distance from a crisis no longer implies distance from its consequences. Terrorist attacks in Brussels in March 2016, in Paris in November the previous year, reminded us of that. The role of criminal networks in the migration crisis is another example of the complexity of the, sec of the security problems that Europe is facing. Most of the last two years, three years, Europe's been 
at least has been taken up with noise, economic and political actions against Russia, some changes in the posture of NATO because of Ukraine, and latterly with noise and failure to predict or even deal with the refugee crisis in Europe. It's indefensible that European interior ministers took so long and were so indecisive in dealing with that crisis. The EU has a lot of structural problems, and the one is its lumbering bureaucratic inefficiency in a crisis. Some would say the EU is itself collapsing, and that the refugee crisis, the Euro crisis, Dutch referendum, British Brexit, Italian referendum have all led us to this point. There is no alternative in Europe but to cooperate more closely. In the past, Europe has de actually demonstrated its ability to emerge stronger from crises. Security challenges to Europe posed by fragile states elsewhere and failed states mean that Europe has to coordinate its activities much more cleverly than it's doing right now. Many of the crises in Europe actually have their origins in that belt of fragile and failed states close to or on its southern borders. It needs a more strategic and comprehensive policy to address the issues of security, development, migration, and humanitarian assistance in fragile states. Europe has to do more than eliminate the self proclaimed Islamic State, it has to take a much longer term view and make sure that the Islamic State's successors, because there will be successors, wherever they emerge, don't find fertile ground for their extremist ideologies in fragile states. In relations with Russia, I was just talking about this, uh, Europe has to remain united, I think, in upholding a respect for international law, democracy, human rights. Russia has contributed to a greater sense of insecurity in Europe. Even so, it is in Europe's long-term interest to develop a more constructive relationship with Russia. So far, the debate over how to deal with Russia hasn't really moved beyond uh, the need to uh, uh, strengthen deterrence by, uh, uh, and that has been constrained in Europe, as usual, by competing uh, priorities and limited resources. NATO has not come up with a political strategy for dealing with Russia. Let's not forget that the Atlantic Treaty is a political treaty, not just a, a, a military treaty. And it doesn't do to just go on condemning Russia and saying that what they're doing is outrageous. You really have to have a policy if you're going to uh, deal with Russia on the question of Crimea or Ukraine or to uh, understand what it's doing in Syria. It has to weigh the national, and this is a, a you know, we're going to talk about Trump, I'm sure, later. I've been thinking about Trump since four o'clock this morning. Um, it, it's time really to look at the national interests of the West against those of Russia uh, and avoid extreme scenarios. Putin has, I think, played a very weak hand extremely well. Uh, the United States and Europe have struggled despite the fact that actually they have a much stronger hand. The next administration needs to recognize that it, although it's operating from relative strength against Russia, uh, it has to deal with a consensus in Europe, and, uh, and that is a key obstacle to dealing with the Russian problem. If Putin uh, recognizes that there's no consensus for this action, he'll take advantage of it, and why not? People are crying out for political leadership right now, and that's really the cry that you hear in Brexit. It's what you're hearing in in France, it's what you're hearing in the Netherlands, it's what you're hearing in Italy. What they get is buck passing and posturing. What they get is sound bites. 1943, November, before the Second Front, before uh, the Allies invaded France, Russians begging them to create a Second Front, 
the governments or authorities being the United Nations or being associated with the United Nations in this war, being determined to provide aid and relief from their suffering, food, clothing, shelter, prevention of pestilence, recovery of health, preparations shall be made for the return of prisoners of war and exiles to their home. Thus was born, when Stalin was pushing for a second front, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. So while two years before the end of the war, enough people had the, the sense to look at what was going to happen afterwards. Between 1943 and 1947, UNRWA, which was the predecessor of UNHCR, employed 12,000 people in Europe and spent 4 billion US dollars on reconstruction, rehabilitation. That was the basis of the modern Europe that you see today. Along with the Marshall Plan, uh, the German Renaissance, Wirtschaftswunder would not have happened had it not been for those decisions made by very smart people at that time. So I was asked to, to speak to you today about new ideas for a new paradigm, and I confess to, to cheating a little in the sense that the new idea I'm advocating is not essentially new. In some ways, it's, it's worse than that. It, it's a recent idea which is born of experience which our leaders, political and military, have chosen to ignore. I've been speaking or preaching about the comprehensive or integrated approach to, the interna to international intervention for some time now. In other words, thinking through what is going to happen afterwards. I've never felt more strongly that the integrated civilian-led approach to international intervention is the only way that you can actually bring broken nations and save them from collapse and damaging all of us when they fall. President Obama, press conference a couple of years ago, he says, I'll give you an example of a lesson I had to learn that still has ramifications to this day, said Obama. And that is our participation in the coalition that overthrew Gaddafi in Libya. I absolutely believed it was the right thing to do. Had we not intervened, it's likely that Libya would be like Syria. Well, and so there would be more death, more disruption, more destruction. But what's also true is that I think our European partners and we underestimated the need to come in full force. And then it's the day after. Gaddafi's gone. Everybody's feeling good. At that moment, there has to be so much more aggressive effort to rebuild societies that didn't have any civic traditions. So that's a lesson, he says, I now apply every time I ask the question, should we intervene? Do we have an answer for the day after? He describes Libya as the biggest failure of his presidency. Well, bravo, Obama. But nonetheless, he's ignored that in subsequent interventions in Iraq, in Syria, and now in Yemen the notion of the day after. The things that we've seen on the beaches of Greece and Turkey and Italy the last two or three years and uh, tell us that for Syria and Libya, and I say Afghanistan and Iraq, nobody thought nearly hard enough about the day after. I've seen nobody yet lay out a plausible blueprint for a post-civil war political order in Syria. And how do we get there? The United States and its allies remain committed to dismantling Bashar al-Assad's regime, reasons that are not hard to understand. But they lack a serious notion of what will happen afterwards. Key admission, the key omission when they invaded Iraq and when they helped topple Muhammad, Muhammad al-Gaddafi in Libya, getting rid of the bad guy and his henchmen was the easy part, but they hadn't the slightest idea what to do afterwards. To intervene or not in humanitarian catastrophes is a very difficult choice. Plenty of occasions in living memory where great powers have actually decided not to intervene. When the UK gave up its colonial empire in, in India in 1947, partition of the subcontinent, 10 million refugees and more than a million dead. That's a level of suffering even worse than you see in Syria today. 
Non-intervention was the policy again in 1971 when there was a war between Pakistan and India over Bangladesh. Pas Pakistan army engaged in the deliberate massacre of some 300,000 Bengalis, forcing 10 million to flee as refugees. No intervention. Khmer Rouge seized power in Cambodia. Hundreds of thousands of people perished in the killing fields. The United States did not react. It's actually the communist government of Vietnam, whom they'd been fighting, who finally reacted and did something about it. You could go on. Uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, Rwanda. Non-intervention, the choice. But when in intervention is the choice, then my view, which I'll expand on later, it has to be based on a political and economic plan which deals with the day after. And of course, intervention must be acceptable in terms of international law. And I don't need to, as, as you've already said in your introduction, I don't need to remind you of the differences between intervention in Afghanistan and Iraq and the NATO war against Serbia and Montenegro. My main new idea is that in the many and multiplying conflict areas there's, uh, around the world, there is need not just for simple military solutions or regime change, but an understanding that a sustainable, stable society can only be built by creating enough security on which to build an inclusive political and economic solution. These are political and economic problems. They're not, on the whole, military problems. Ambassador Goodness, you just doubled the size of the audience. <laughs> ambassador Charles Freeman, Jr. is one of the smartest American ambassadors I've met in the last 25 years. And uh, I, he and I share almost identical views on interventionism of this kind. No one knows how many Iraqis have died or as a, as a direct or indirect result of the US invasion and the anarchy that's followed it. Some people say 100,000, some say well over a million. Two and a quarter million Iraqis fled to neighboring countries. Only 5% have gone home. Equal number sought temporary refuge inside Iraq itself. Most of them are still displaced. Now, to try to understand those, but certainly not condone, not agree with, but understand the action of Times Square car bomber Faisal Shahzad, man who let off a bomb in Times Square. Conversation between him and the American judge, Miriam Cedarbaum. She challenged Shahzad when he said he was a Muslim soldier because of his contemplated violence targeting civilians in New York. Did you look around to see who they were, she asked. Well, the people select the government, Shahzad retorted. We consider them all the same. The drones, when they hit, she interrupted, including the children. Shahzad said, well, the drone hits in Afghanistan and Iraq. They don't see children. They don't see anybody. They kill women, children. They kill everybody. It's a war. And in a war, you kill people. They are killing all the Muslims. So I say, you don't need to agree with him, you don't need to condone what he did. It's worth listening to what he says because no amount of, and here we come to communications, no amount of public diplomacy or psyops, psychological operations, however cleverly they're conducted, can prevail over the bitterness and personal and collective experience. The only way to reverse th that kind of trend of anti-Western feeling is to reverse the policy which brought it about in the first place. One of the main lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan is that there are some lessons for which invasion and occupation on their own are inappropriate and ineffective responses. The use of force in Iraq hasn't shaped the country to the Western will, nor vindicated Western values. After the loss of more than 6,000 lives and spending $900 billion in Iraq, one clear achievement, they got rid of Saddam Hussein. 
and they leave behind a traumatized society, brutalized by anarchy, sectarian violence. Iraq's constitutional order, its prospects for domestic tranquility, all in doubt still after all this time. The longest war in American history. I don't think either the Iraqi people or the West will remember Iraq's co encounter with the coalition proudly or fondly. The years to come are likely to produce, produce more reminders of Iraq's agony and the West's lack of vision uh, as we go on with this century. As for Afghanistan, Afghanistan has always defined itself as a confederation of tribes and localities that cooperate for limited purposes while resisting central or foreign control. Ethiopia the same, Somalia the same. These are traditional feudal societies. Only alien presence in Afghanistan right now, US and some coalition of forces, aid agencies and NGOs. And locally they're depicted as being there to impose allegiance to Korbel, challenge tribal customs, not to make common cause with tribal leaders or local authorities. It's a nuisance. It attracts attention from homegrown, not foreign guerrillas, and that disturbs the peace. Oh, and by the way, this is a discussion for another day. Ironically, the primary strategic effort of the policies of the US and its allies allies has been to eliminate Iran's enemies in Afghanistan and Iraq and greatly increasing Iran's influence in Iraq, Lebanon and Palestine uh, and cementing Iran's alliance with Syria. So did anybody think that through either at the time? There should be an end to military intervention abroad except for decisive action for pre precise purposes and over a limited time. Long way towards curbing the further growth of the terrorist threat. If necessary, short-term interventions with the authority of the United Nations and as part of a long-term, sustainable political and economic solution are fine. Which takes me back to my new old idea. So what do you think about the UN and its capabilities of dealing with international peace and security through the mechanism of peacekeeping and peace building? In this part of the world, perhaps not very much. Too much politics, too little decisive action, waste of resources, bad command and control structures, poor security, soldiers who are only there for the money. During my time in peacekeeping, all those things were true to a greater or lesser extent. And yet the UN can deliver large numbers of troops quickly. It's proven its ability to operate and sustain missions in some of the most difficult parts of the world. Had some extraordinary successes, some really bloody failures. UN peacekeeping statistically more likely to succeed than any other kind, and it's cheaper. And through the learning processes that the UN went through in Cambodia, in the Balkans, Haiti, Central America, Namibia, Mozambique, the UN developed a concept known as now as the comprehensive or integrated approach. The, uh, an understanding that peace can either be kept or built just on a military plan. Uh, it has to go together with a medium or long-term political economic strategy. Most important lesson in a way learned, I think, in the last 25 years by the UN, and I think now possibly also by NATO, who knows, is that with the right resources, the right mandate, the right leadership, this kind of approach actually works. Next few years, you're going to hear a lot more about Mali, Central African Republic, ungoverned spaces in Northwest Africa, Yemen, Somalia, as being real threats to us here in Europe which we need to deal with in a comprehensive way. What that kind of peacekeeping intervention needs is professional military leaders who understand that it's essentially a political problem that they are dealing with, and smart politicians and governments to manage the broader process. United Nations facing enormous challenges around the world today we're asking peacekeepers to do more in more places, more complex conflicts that at any time in history. 
environments, which, as I said, are inhospitable, remote, different kinds of missions. You increasingly, UN peacekeepers are asked to take a more robust uh, way of, do to, uh, of doing business. Two-thirds of UN peacekeepers these days are operating in active conflict areas where there's a real conflict going on. Warring parties, extremist groups, terrorized civilians regard the UN and international aid workers as legitimate targets. So what I'm saying is this. Peacekeeping and peace building, national security, human security issues form one continuum. You simply can't divorce one part of that from the other. There's no dividing line between the hard issues and the easier issues anymore. Not limited by national borders. Have a look at the borders of some of those countries where there's intervention by uh, the UN and others in West Africa. You can't separate mi military and civilian pro problems anymore. Conflict prevention, conflict resolution, together the basis on which we have to work. Uh, Integrated approach, as, as we call it, is a reality. There's no magic to that. Basically, it says we're all going to go into this. Uh, we've all got more or less the same objectives. Let's work out before we start how we're going to get there and what we're going to do. Uh, it's more difficult in practice than it is uh, in theory. But without it, peacekeeping, peace building simply won't work. In insurgencies like Afghanistan, the message of the enemy, if you like, is very clear. These foreigners will leave. We will stay, stick with us, we are your future. There's only one way you can deal with that, and this is by giving people a sustainable alternative. You've got to give people a future that they can believe in without those folk. They matter to us here in, in Europe and, and in North America because violence in any country these days can quickly cause national and regional instability, displacing millions of people. You've had to visit the uh, campus just down the road here last summer to see that, two, three thousand people a day. They matter to us because those conflicts far away from us attract extremist groups uh, who use that vacuum that's created in ungoverned countries, if you like, to terrorize civilian populations, but more importantly for us, to launch attacks and plan attacks on us in Europe. The suffering that's caused there, of course, is a recruitment tool too. State authority breaks down, places of conflict can be comfortable places for extremists whether it's Darfur or Mali or the Central African Republic or Mauritania, Nigeria, Burundi, Yemen, we simply cannot ignore those crises. There's going to be a continuing demand for UN and regional peacekeeping based on an integrated model, I think. And they, these operations will include military force in their early stages. But military force really isn't the answer to the problem. Is UN, OSCE, NATO, African Union, peacekeeping fit for purposes? Well, it's going to be a tough few years, I suspect. The Security Council, supposed to guide these matters, hasn't been as divided as it is now since uh, the end of the Cold War. Secretary General of the UN, outgoing Secretary General, the world is changing and peace operations have to change with it. The sovereign states of Syria, Libya, and Yemen are dying right now. And we're standing by effectively and watching. Some of us even making it worse. Russia and China, I think, give a little insight into that because we're talking about sovereignty. Sovereignty, which was a keystone of the founding of the United Nations. But what does it actually mean these days? Consistent attempts are being made to turn the Security Council into an office to rubber stamp the decision of the leader, the United States. And when these attempts fail, they try to remove the UN Security Council from developing a policy on its key competence. So says Sergei Lavrov. Uh, 
We should uphold the principles of sovereign equality and non-interference in internal affairs. Sovereignty is the symbol of a country's independence. Sovereign independence and territorial integrity of countries must not be infringed upon, so says China. Who's, who's to argue with that? And the interventions in Kosovo and Libya and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan since the wide acceptance of Kofi Annan's right to protect. So Kofi Annan came up with, and it was accepted, the theory that there was a moment when it was perfectly OK. Sovereignty did not include abusing your own citizens in large numbers. However, using that as an excuse in Libya and elsewhere has left the Russians and Chinese and a lot of members of the UN General Assembly deeply skeptical of Western motives. That skepticism, a daily feature now of work in the Security Council. One stage of my life I used to spend about two days, two and a half days a week sitting in the council. Very exciting, by the way. Still, even for an old cynic like me, walking into that Security Council chamber is, gives you a certain frisson. There's a lot of history going on in that very lovely room. But it's a feature now, this skepticism and mistrust is go to a point in the council which is worse, I think, than, than most people have ever seen it. So mistrust in the General Assembly, mistrust because of, largely because of, not entirely because of, military intervention in other people's countries. General Assembly in October last year, this year, leading head of government, not known for rhetoric actually, said it seems that Washington, and we can use Washington, America, and NATO interchangeably, because NATO is dominated by the United States, everybody else is effectively junior in rank. America, he said, has used NATO and it has used the European Union as the means in which it can have these designs implemented. By designs, I mean the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya, the attempt to overthrow Assad in Syria. Russia and China were duped when it came to the UN position on Libya. Effectively, now we can see what it was. It was right from the beginning a deceptive arrangement based on overthrowing Gaddafi. The lack of spine in the European leadership is particularly regretful in the sense that the Americans have forced them to do things which are against their own interests. The occupation and attempted pacification of Muslim lands like Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the shocking hate speech about Islam that now pervades United States politics, lend credence to a, deep, a deepening Muslim perception of an es escalating Western crusade against Islam and its believers. So said a normally quite reasonable head of government in the General Assembly this year. Not very welcome to a lot of people, but I suspect if you were to carry out a straw poll of members of the General Assembly right now, about 60 to 70 percent would share that view. The world should be preventing, I have no doubt at all, that the world should be preventing mass murder in Syria and Libya and elsewhere. Will we face up to that? Well, with the differences in the Security Council, crumbling national borders, it's not going to be easy. What the UN has is experience of committed people, moral stance that people and states are better served by peaceful means than by violence. The strength of the UN for me was derived from a basic faith that dialogue is actually superior and is the only road to balance. Dag Hammarskjöld said, the UN was not created to take mankind to heaven, but to save humanity from hell. So here we sit in rainy, cold Belgrade, and we look, do well to think about the hell that is actually present in Syria and Lirib and Libya and Iraq and Yemen and much of Northwest Africa, not to mention those long ongoing conflicts which none of us can remember. Are we doing enough to save humanity from hell? Politicians in our European heaven point to Russia as a real threat and they may or may not be right. 
But shouldn't we be reminding them that they need to ask them whether they're doing enough to make the UN, NATO, OSCE, the African Union work and come up with plans which deal with not just military intervention but the day after? Comprehensive plans for sorting out people's problems rather than just getting rid of the bad guys. I said my emphasis would be on the day after. Let me end with a question. Do you think that somewhere in Florida, in Italy, wherever, there is a group of expensive people sitting down making plans for what will happen in Syria after the departure of Assad <coughs> or when there is some kind of political settlement? If not, then the settlement won't bring peace at all. Everyone knows that. What I'm saying is pretty obvious, really. But no one is committed to the day after. I don't believe that group of people exists. I don't believe that anybody has thought about the two, three, four, five, ten billion dollars that's going to be needed to put Syria back together again. And the question at the end of the thing is, why the hell not? Thank you very much.